Hello and uh, welcome to uh, Mrs AB Literature. Today's lesson uh, we are focusing on exploring the key symbols and motifs in The Handmaid's Tale. Okay, as normal, um, just continue with the tutorial. If you feel that you need to stop to do any notes, uh, then just pause the tutorial, uh, take the notes and then come back to it and restart it when you're ready. Good luck, hope you enjoy. Okay, quick do now task. Um, the Handmaid's Tale is full of doubles. Um, you can see a picture here uh, from the TV series um, where uh, the, the example is of the two handmaids who have to walk down the street together um, as a double. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is just to think about, um, if we're looking at symbolism of mot and motifs, think about doubles throughout the book. Are there any doppelgangers? A doppelganger is a double, it's a double of a character. Are there any echoes of characters? Are there any character sort of foils or sort of symbols of one particular character reappearing in another, for example? Uh, can you highlight a couple, ha ha, a couple of these doubles even, and explain why Atwood might have included that doubling at that point in the novel? Um, just a word of warning for this uh, tutorial, it's likely you're going to need your Handmaid's Tale, your copy of your book with you as you proceed through the lesson. Uh, okay, so um, just pause the tutorial now and um, continue it when you're ready. All right, I've, I've done a little bit myself here. Um, we can see the motif of doubles appears um, again and again. Um, we'll come back to this idea of uh, doubling later on uh, when we look at mirrors and the symbolism of mirrors because there's an awful lot of doubling in reflections within the, uh, the novel. Um, but here we've got um, many doubles for Offred. Uh, the first one is, is the woman that has lived in her room before this ghostly double of a, a handmaid who um, she finds out later has committed suicide. Um, she um, feels that almost like the, um, the other handmaid is existing in that room with her. Um, there was always, she says, there were always two of us. Um, and the significance of that very simple sentence there, there were always two of us, um, re reoccurs when we realise that um, handmaids are not allowed to walk around the streets on their own. So when they're sent out to, um, to do errands, to do their shopping, which is one of their, their tasks that they're, they're having to do, um, there's always two of them. Um, so again, this idea here where she walks out with Offglen. Offglen is quite an interesting double. Not only is she the double of Offred, here we get the quotation double, I walk the street. Um, showing that, um, you know, sort of Moira is literally the kind of the physical, the, the um, appearance double of um, Offred. It's an interesting, and this is completely off the point, but the idea of I walk the street there, um, I think that this is deliberate by Margaret Atwood using this phraseology, um, the idea of the street walkers or a prostitute, perhaps a suggestion of um, Offred's own distaste or maybe a humour in her own um, homodiegetic narrative where she, um, she feels a little bit like, you know, that she's a double of a prostitute almost from the, from the previous times. Um, Offred also, oh, sorry, Offglen also turns out to be more like Moira's double than Offred. Um, she, um, Moira is a character foil, I would say, for Offred. Uh, she rebels where Offred doesn't. Offred, um, doesn't accept. She rebels in her, uh, in her head, but physically, Offred is less rebellious than Moira. Interestingly, Offglen has seems to be more like a double. She's partnered with Offred, um, but Offglen we find out is a rebel in disguise, um, and she, um, 
is also rebellious in the way that she comments on things like the Pravaganza. Um, and again, this idea of committing suicide after the salvaging um, is perhaps something that you could argue may have happened or may well happen to Moira. Um, another double is um, Janine. Uh, Janine is off red gone further, I would say. She's a warning of what might happen if Offred gives up hope. Uh, Janine is a laughable character. We, we, we pity her, but the pity is um, quite condescending. Um, and she appears at various stages in the narrative. Um, she's the willing victim at the Rachel and Leah Centre um, with the testifying um, and she also becomes pregnant as off Warren and then lastly her appearance at the Particution uh, where she lapses into this very sort of um, violent uh, bacchanal type character who rips, um, rips the, the, the victim apart at the Particution. Um, she is off red gone further. Uh, Offred also tells the story of the commander's wife with flashbacks to her earlier career. There is a doubling here almost. Um, Offred is, um, she remembers back to her career, how she was successful um, in the workplace. And of course, um, we get this sense as well because Serena Joy was a TV personality. She was a gospel singer. She was a presenter. She was somebody who is, um, was looked up to by women. Um, across the, the the nation but both Offred and Serena Joy um, have to leave that behind and become trapped by the Gileadian uh, society the ideology that women um, should occupy the private sphere and then the public sphere um, so again there, there is there, there are parallels between her and Serena Joy um, we also get doubling in terms of um, the uh, Offred's past life. So at the time before, um, this doubling of two types, two parts of Offred's personality um, that, um, you know, one is conformist, one is um, ambitious as a, as a sort of a career woman. Um, She's also a symbol herself of the women and what women have become, past and present, how they perhaps have never had any rights or, um, or women who struggle with, with um, defending their own rights in society. Um, so she can be a, be, become a double of perhaps the women who are reading the novel at the time. Okay, so there's a few ideas there. Um, I'm sure you, you've got some different, you may have got some similar, but... Um, I would imagine all of those are valid. Okay, so moving on then. Uh, we now move on to the symbolism of the colour red. Now, we've done a fair amount of this in class. Um, so can you list those symbolisms of the colour red uh, within the novel? Uh, what can you remember we've done in class about this symbolism? Uh, I'll just give you a few minutes to continue, um, write your notes, and then we'll continue with the... Uh, with the presentation. So if you stop the tutorial now and then we can continue in a second. Okay, so on the next couple of slides I've got some images. We Again, the, the image of red, what does it symbolise? It actually is very, very contradictory in its visual symbolism. So I just want you to have a look at these, um, uh, these images and there are plenty more uh, symbols that you know that are related to the color red um, so what are the connotations in each of the uh, instances are they all consistent or are they contradictory well I've already perhaps suggested that you might find some contradictions there um, are they specific to a particular culture or maybe to a particular religion or do they cross over cultures do you think now I think I've put I've put four pictures on there um, but again symbolically if you think of things that are red what does that symbolise? You know, what does red in itself symbolise, I suppose? Okay, all right, so moving on then. Again, if you need to with these images, just stop the tutorial and continue when you're ready.
Now, um, Margaret Atwood wrote a poem called A Red Shirt. She wrote it uh, dedicated to her sister um, and the first section of the poem provides an interesting commentary on perhaps what her focus was regarding the, the symbolism of the colour red uh, in The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I'm going to read this to you and what I'd like you to do is just think about um, any of these echoes from this poem that you might have actually seen in The Handmaid's Tale. I'm just sort of making a quick note of them as I'm reading. A red shirt for Ruth. My sister and I are sewing a red shirt for my daughter. She pins, I hem, we pass the scissors back and forth across the table. Children should not wear red, a man once told me. Young girls should not wear red. In some countries it is the colour of death, in others passion, in others war, in others anger, in others the sacrifice of shed blood. A girl should be a veil, a white shadow, bloodless as a moon on water. Okay, I'm just going to stop there. The the um, poem is a lot longer, um, but again, you can sort of see the uh, the ideas running through here, even to the point of, um, we're going to come back to this in a moment, the idea of the scissors, um, sort of snipping and sewing that red shirt, that trimming of the red shirt there. Um, but I love the idea of the children not wearing red, but who told her? It was a man that told her. Um, again, the sort of deontic modality in that in that poem with the should not, a modal auxiliary verb there is repeated. Young girls should not wear red. Um, and then the listing that comes in the third stanza there, it is the colour of death in, in others' passion, in others' war, in others' angers, anger, in others' the sacrifice of shed blood. Um, again, all of those, those images, in fact, it's not just one culture. In fact, it seems to be that Gilead has, has adopted all of those, those symbolisms of the colour red. And then finally, the idea, and we've got this kind of parallelism almost with the, uh, the second stanza, a girl should not wear, wear red to a girl should be. Again, the deontic modality there, a veil, a white shadow, bloodless as a moon on water. Um, so again this idea you know what the young girls would look like so I want to just sort of spend some time exploring that now um, interestingly we're talking about um, red but one motif that comes up quite a lot in the novel is this idea of red shoes um, there, there's lots of references to you know putting on your red shoes that they're flat um, Offred says they're flat and they're practical um, but red shoes has, have a certain cultural significance and I don't know whether this, this poem actually kind of refers to that. Um, the, uh, when she was a child, Margaret Out was quite interested in a film called The Red Shoes and it's based on a, um, a sort of a cultural um, folk tale um, of the same name. Uh, in fact, I've seen the ballet. Um, of the, of um, of that story, which is basically where a dancer who's very very ambitious um, accepts a pair of red shoes from a man from an admirer, um, and he says if she wears these shoes she will become successful as a ballet dancer, and uh, she puts the shoes on and when she wears them she is the most beautiful dancer in the world. And she's captivated by her dancing and she enchants her, her audiences. But um, the shoes are magical. And um, they start to control her. So that when she takes them off, she yearns to put them on. And when she has them on, she is literally enchanted by them. And becomes... Um, overwhelmed and consumed by them so that in the end her identity her original identity no longer exists uh, it's a it's a great ballet if you ever get to see it um, but if not have a look just look up um, that folk tale now you could perhaps uh, stop the tutorial at this point um, and uh, take a look to do a little bit of research on the red shoes Now, um, potentially, this um, has become then an icon of um, the idea of female independence 
this idea of red shoes perhaps they they do um you know are they captivating are they um you know are they uh, making you a captive um of course the alternative which actually could be the opposite is red shoes do signal signify the idea of female independence in terms of kind of quite quite they're quite provocative sexually uh, so the sort of sexual allure of uh, red shoes um, actually perhaps aren't contradictory in, in The Handmaid's Tale, but some things to think about there. Okay, so what else can we say then? So the colour red, um, I'm sure you've got this. I'm sure you had this in that initial task uh, when, we looked at, when you looked at this. Um, but we've got red is the symbol of fertility. Um, so the handmaid's primary function is to um, reproduce. Uh, and of course of the female reproductive system. Um, Offred actually says the colour of blood defines us. Um, you know, that is what they are identified with, this idea of their their female body, their feminine body, the, uh, you know, the fact that they, um, the, the menstrual blood actually does um, signify uh, their fertility, that they're still fertile. The irony is, you can see on the next bullet point there, is the menstrual blood also appears, when it appears, it shows failure. Because, of course, when a woman menstruates, it's a sign that she's not pregnant. So there is a contradiction in the idea of the hope displayed by the menstrual blood, but also the failure when it appears as well. Um, we've also got the blood present at childbirth, and we see this very clearly um, in the birthing section of the, the novel um, and this idea of kind of the red curtains um, in the, the, the car that transports them to the, the birthing. Um, so there's, the, again, this idea of, you know, the blood present, the blood letting, um, you know, at childbirth. Um, there's another intertextual link with a book called, it's a, I suppose a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne, it's, he's an Ameri was an American writer, wrote The Scarlet Letter. Um, and the basis of the story goes is that Hester Prynne, uh, the female protagonist there, uh, was accused of adultery um, and her um, punishment was to wear a scarlet A on her dress uh, so that she can show everybody that she is an adulteress. Um, so again, this idea that red symbols, um, you know, women who have, who are uh, too sexually independent. Uh, we see this idea and this motif again in The Crucible, uh, written by Arthur Miller, loosely with um, the character of Abigail, um, who again is accused of admit admitting, sorry, committing adultery. Um, and uh, part of the, the tragedy of the crucible is her ways of how she blames others to try and actually uh, deflect the blame away from herself. Um, you can see in the picture there, I mean, this is obviously a very, very familiar image now of, um, you know, people dressed up as handmaids. In fact, the, the whole handmaid's um, sort of cape and hood, uh, which you've got here, is um, symbolic of women trying to, ironically, trying to um, campaign for their own rights. Um, we've, we've seen it in protests in America, for example. Um, but the red is the colour of their habit. It looks like a nun's habit, um, but they're actually defined by it. And um, Offred describes herself as a sister dripped in blood. Okay. So other colour symbolism. So you can see the pictures here. Of These are all from the TV series, which I wouldn't recommend um, actually viewing until you have taken this exam because it will become too confusing. So please don't look at the TV um, series until you've finished. That said, the, uh, the, some of the pictures from the, the TV series are actually really useful. So here we've got the three costumes of the three main female protagonists. Or you could argue Aunt Lydia there on the uh, the bottom is a is the antagonist. Um, Serena Joy's uh, she's conflicted. She's there's ambiguity 
about her because she in fact both of them because they're both constrained still by the uh, the regime even though you could argue they have slightly more power than the handmaids anyway so we've got the three costumes now costumes and color symbolism are highly related in the handmaid's tale so the first of all i haven't got the commander up here but the black the costume of the commander represents fear authority and autocracy so autocracy is this idea that um, man, one man perhaps, is controlling um, and controlling in a totalitarian regime. Um, it's interesting that, um, and, and I think this probably isn't a, a coincidence, that Atwood um, chose black for the commanders, is that priests wear black. And of course we, we have, I, I'm not dealing with the religious imagery here, um, because it's probably another lesson in itself. Um, but the idea of pr priests wearing that black traditionally. Um, now, I looked this up and symbolically, um, it represents the priest dying to himself. I say himself, now of course we have female priests. Um, a bit like a nun. So a nun will wear a black habit once she graduates. But when she's a novice, I believe she wears white. So it's actually quite, in some ways, there's some similarities with The Handmaid's Tale. But the priests work for the greater good. Uh, the idea of black actually kind of, you know, taking away any individuality. I suppose all of the colours, they group, they stereotype and group uh, these people that have certain functions in, in Gileadian society. Uh, you've then got the blue of the wives, um, the, the most obvious um, connection there is symbolic of the Virgin Mary um, the idea again that um, you know they are fairly asexual uh, the Virgin Mary hasn't had sex obviously before she fell pregnant um, but this idea that their their role in in the society is not about their sexuality it's not about their fertility it's um, about sort of um, uh, presenting a, a role, a, a sort of a feminine role within the, the house. And again, we'll deal with that a little bit more later. Uh, the khaki of the aunts there is quite interesting. It's a military colour. Um, uh, so again, she does wear a dress. They all wear dresses. But the femininity seems to have been taken out. If you look at the difference between the handmaid's uh, dress, um, which actually does show the curves, it shows the hips. Um, compared to perhaps the other two, where that femininity seems to have been taken out. Um, they, apparently, I, I mean, I looked this up, but apparently the Nazis, they, they had um, a, a rank, a group of military called stormtroopers, nothing to do with Star Wars. And they were known as the brown shirts because they wore brown. Um, and actually, if you look at the khaki uniforms of the British Army as well, it's very military. Um, the unmarried girls wore white, obviously symbolic of purity, and the econo wives are quite interesting. They wore, they wear stripes. Um, it's basically a functional uniform, um, a bit like a nurse. The old-fashioned nurses perhaps used to wear um, very, very thin stripes, but also uh, perhaps symbolic of the stripes of prisoners. Um, interesting again, um, and I think I think you do get some TV series, but again, don't watch it before. Um, they they can wear red, blue and green actually suggests they're meant to fulfil all of the female roles obviously the green there being servant classes uh, so the Marthas um, the blue the symbolising the uh, the wives and the red the handmaids so, so again quite a lot of good colour symbolism ok the eyes now we the eyes of uh, big brother you can see that's one of the logos on the at the top there um, is used and the Margaret Atwood seems to have adopted this motif this logo um, for um, her own Gileadian society part of the Gileadian logo uh, depending on which one you look at actually does include the eye as um, a central part of the design um, now Eyes, a society in which everything is visible to an unknown hostile, hostile authority, sometimes known as a panoptic. Um, so pan meaning 
total. Um, so, um, you know, uh, topically, a pandemic is something that is global. Um, you see in the Hunger Games, no, Panem is the name of the uh, the government in the New America in the Hunger Games. Uh, that that kind of prefix there, pan, suggesting total or global. Um, now, of course, Gilead was only supposed to represent is only supposed to represent sort of America, um, but the idea here that uh, somebody unseen is all knowing. Um, is is very clear in the Handmaid's Tale. It's actually something that um, uh, Margaret Atwood got from uh, 1984 uh, with the phrase Big Brother, where we get the TV series from, Big Brother is always watching you. Um, and the idea in, in 1984 that actually uh, it's not just um, surveillance and visual control, but actually the uh, the authorities can control your mind and your thoughts um so it, it goes 1984 goes one step further i would say than um uh, the handmaid's tale so a panoptic is actually a, a conventional feature of a dystopian fiction um, which we could argue handmaid's tale kind of falls into that genre um so and then the the last one i've got there is of course one of the phrases um, that people use in Gilead all the time is under his eye, his referring to God. But again, this idea that we've got this all-knowing, all-seeing God who is judgmental. Um, and whilst the phrase is supposed to um, suggest that it's a you know it's like a comfort to whoever says it, it's like a blessing to whoever says it. Again, there is there is this ambiguity with this phrase because there is a sense of underlying threat with it as well. And the other thing that I found quite interesting, if you look at the um, the section where Offred uh, looks around her room for the first time, she she goes, she says, "Oh, I wanted to savor this," and she she sections a room off and deals with a section of it each day. Uh, and part of that narrative she looks at the ceiling and she realizes that there is a bit of a kind of a, a crack in the plaster and on the ceiling there is something that looks like an eye as though again symbolic that she is always being watched even when she feels she's she's on her own in her own room perhaps again this idea um, that she has no privacy you know she can't she can't lock the door for example um, suggesting that she's she's under surveillance all the time Okay, so the next one is mirrors. So handmaids are not allowed mirrors. They're not allowed to look at their own reflection. Um, the reasoning behind it is that um, uh, fundamentalist Christians would, would argue vanity is one of the deadly sins. Um, so self-vanity. Um, so uh, it's against the law. Um, but symbolically, this lack of mirrors actually removes the handmaid's identity because they're unable to look on their appearance anymore um you know the face being kind of the site of um or one of the major sites of your own identity um the removal of mirrors also links to the removal of other dangerous objects so for example uh, books um and uh, other things that could be used as weapons in fact the irony is is that both mirrors if you break them and books because of what's contained in them, both of these could actually be formed into weapons. Perhaps one of the reasons why um, handmaids are not allowed them. Uh, in another instance, Offred does actually say that um, when when she's listening to the commander read before the ceremony, and she says that uh, you know books are too dangerous; they kept locked away because women are not supposed to read them. OK, I just want you just to spend a few more minutes now before you move on thinking about reflections or mirrors. Where do they appear in the novel and what might the significance of this be? So again, just pause the tutorial at this point, take some notes and then when you're ready, you can restart. Right, actually, if we think of that mirrors are actually what we call a proscribed object in other words they're forbidden 
Um, mirrors actually and reflections occur quite a lot in the novel. So we have a repeat, repeated motif here. Uh, so there is one in the hall in the uh, commander's house. Um, but as Offred looks at it, it distorts her reflection. So it, again, it distorts her identity. She describes it as a round convex pier glass, which is a circular mirror, um, like the eye of a fish, and myself in it like a distorted shadow, a parody of something. Um, so it distorts her image. But again, the link between mirrors and eyes here is really, really clear. That as she walks up, um, I think it's on in the hallway, so as she walks up the stairs, it's almost like something's watching her. Um, again, you've got the hall mirror again. My face dis uh, distant and distorted. Uh, the use of that word again, distorted there twice, suggesting that, um, you know, this, the, the symbolism there, that um, it sees her differently and she her identity is changed and distorted by Gilead. Um, and then again, a brief waif. A waif is um, a, a traditionally is like a ghost, I suppose. Um, we call, uh, you know, maybe we call a sort of a thin, pale, pale looking child a waif and stray. Um, but the original kind of derivation of that word comes from the idea of um, sort of being so pale and ghost like and poor, I suppose. Uh, in the eye of the glass that hangs on the downstairs wall. And then finally, in the curved hallway mirror, again, the same mirror, I flip past a red shape at the edge of my own field of vision, a wraith here of red smoke. Now, it's interesting, it's not the same word as waif. Here, wraith does mean ghost. So a waif is a, a ghost of oneself. It's a waif and stray. A wraith is, is, is a ghost. But the ideas are similar. Um, reflections here she can catch a reflection of herself but they have to be fleeting they can't be any more than that she's not allowed to be seen to be looking in the mirror um, and what she sees anyway is a distortion um, and then also this idea of um, uh, mirrors occurs again we see a mirror in Jezebel's when she goes into the toilets uh, massive difference here. They haven't taken the mirrors out of Jezebel's because women need to look at their reflection because, of course, they need to be um, sexually attractive to the men there. So it's an important part of their role and their function. So here they haven't removed the mirror, she says. You need to know here what you look like. Um, but also, um, not necessarily in a mirror, we also catch a reflection of off Fred and off Glen um, in the window of the Soul Scrolls, uh, where off Fred says, She's like my own reflection, a mirror from which I am moving away. Um, again, this kind of because they wouldn't know what each other looks like. So, uh, the wings on the hats, on the uh, on the, the headdresses that they have don't allow them to look into each other's faces. It's, a, it's another mechanism of control. Um, and the only way they can actually see what each other looks like and facial expressions is to look in this window. Ironically, in Soul Scrolls, which is obviously where they um, try and get uh, wisdom from God and their, their kind of prayers are answered through this you know, ticker tape kind of system. Um, but actually there is also a realisation that whilst they can look at each other's faces in the reflection, that they do still look exactly the same. Um, and this lack of individual individualism um, is something that perhaps hits Offred at this point, uh, that she really has had her identity taken away. Uh, OK, so I apologise for the uh, lecture-like focus of this lesson. I hope it's useful. Uh, and I hope it sparks other ideas that you can also think about because obviously these are just mine uh, and there's plenty more to go. So, you know, I'm only really sort of scratching the surface on some of these things. OK, so the next symbol is flowers. I like this. Um, I think uh, the first thing to do is just to, uh, I've given you the extract here from chapter three in the book. This is where Ofra goes out into the garden and she sees the wife tending the flowers. Um, 
have a go just to stop the tutorial for the moment you can look in your book it's literally at the beginning of chapter three uh, i haven't put the page numbers because the pages in my book are slightly different to yours um, but have a look at it annotate this part of the text um, i think you've looked at it in lessons anyway so uh, what is the symbolism of the flowers here uh, and again once you've finished uh, then feel free to restart the uh, tutorial So I really like this extract. Uh, so she goes out by the back door, I mean that's symbolic in itself, into the garden, which is large and tidy. Uh, how does this, I mean this really describes Serena Joy, uh, large and tidy, a lawn in the middle. But look at um, the plants that are growing there. So we have a willow, weeping catkins around the edge. Uh, this, the plant life here is symbolic of misery and uh, depredation so a willow is actually they've missed out the word but a willow we normally call it a weeping willow it has droopy very very long sort of strands for its leaves um, and weeping catkins are the same they're drooping downwards um, the idea obviously weeping so it looks like they're shedding tears uh, we've got the flower borders now flowers in this uh, in in the uh, novel uh, represent fertility um, and we have um, two different types of flowers described here the first ones are the daffodils which are now fading and then we've also got the tulips which are just coming into season at the moment the tulips are opening their cups spilling out colour um i'll come to the next bit in a moment but the idea here that the daffodils are now fading i know daffodils are yellow but i just think this is symbolic of the um the older commander's wives that uh you know that color that perhaps they once had when they were younger is is uh, is fading away and their fertility because they otherwise they wouldn't have needed handmade if they were fertile so this kind of fading i think is quite symbolic um, the tulips are opening their cups is openly sexual in, in its imagery, um, you know, opening their cups, opening their legs, um, opening themselves up to be um, impregnated, all of this, spilling out colour. Again, maybe this idea of blood we've talked about before, the spillage of blood um, is, is, it comes back here in the this idea. So the tulips represent the budding, the fertile uh, handmaids. It then says the tulips are red, a darker crimson towards the stem, as if they've been cut and are beginning to heal there. Um, again, perhaps sort of symbolic of um, pregnancy and childbirth there, um, or even possibly the idea of caesarean section. Um, we're then told the garden is the domain of the commander's wife. So there's a, a huge irony here. The commander's wife, who is infertile, is tending these flowers that are the symbol of fertility. Um, looking out through my shatterproof window, I've often seen her in it, her knees on a cushion, a light blue veil thrown over her wide gardening hat, a basket at her side with shears in it and pieces of string for tying the flowers into place. The garden detail to the commander sorry, the guardian even, detail to the commander, does the heavy digging, the commander's wife directs, pointing with a stick. Many of the wives have such gardens. It's something for them to order and maintain and care for. The irony there is that um, most of them don't have children, so they can't care for their children, they care for their gardens. It's like a, a substitute child. Um, so I'll just go back there. The idea there again of... of um, I really like the idea of the shears. Um, again, in the TV production, they, they do this quite well. Um, the fact that she has a basket and um, there's a sense of her envy and her jealousy of the handmaids here as she snips the stems of the tulips um, and effectively kills them. Um, but what she wants to do to them. Not only that is that she gathers those flowers together and she ties them in place this suggestion that she is in control and that she wants to hurt 
um, the handmaids the, because they're fertile. Okay, I'm going to move on now and look at another time. Um, Margaret Atwood, or Offred in a narrative, almost um, quotes that time in the garden word for word. And it's, just, it's a short while on uh, when she looks at the um, people on the wall. Uh, with the sacks over their heads and she she notices one has a red smile which is the blood that's come through the sack um, so again the red of the tulip is repeated here um, and what we've got is um, in a figurative sense here it says I look at the one red smile the red of the smile is the same as the red of the tulips in Serena Joy's garden towards the base of the flowers where they're beginning to heal the red is the same, but there is no connection. The tulips are not tulips of blood. The red smiles are not flowers. Neither thing makes a comment on the other. The tulip is not a reason for disbelief in the hanged man or vice versa. So again, this idea here, she makes that connection between the red of the blood and the red of the, um, the tulips, that direct link between blood and the, and the flower. Um, she acknowledges the red is the same but she actually realises that the red here is not about fertility it's not about flowers it's not about femininity it's about the um, the darkness that's at the heart of the Gilead regime um, this idea again that um, all of the practices in society are, are um, there's an undertone of violence that runs through it and we see that undertone of violence in the previous extract where Serena Joy is, is merrily or not so merrily snipping um, the tulips so that they can be taken into the house to uh, you know to decorate her house um, there's, de there's definite parallels between the two other flowers then, we're nearly at the end here, um, lots of nice pictures for you, um, so and just a wa word of warning, there are loads more in the novel, I've just, just picked out a few, um, I've actually, uh, one of the pictures um, does actually talk about lilies um, here, um, so seeds and flowers represent life and fertility and actually they're usually gift given in love. But that's something that's now lacking in Gilead. Love is not needed in a Gileadian sort of um, regime. Um, what what is actually needed is procreation. To be, it's the act without the love. So flowers in Gilead are often characterised by fading or by violence. So we've got the blue iris, which is the 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 blue one that's under uh, the second one down. So not the top. Um, now this comes from a picture in the house that, sh that um, Offred comments on and she says it's symbolic of faith and hope. Sorry, no she doesn't say that. F um, an iris is the symbol of faith and hope. Uh, actually echoes of the cushion set in Offred's room. Um, she has um, the cushion that still says faith and it comes from 1 Corinthians 13 in the Bible. Um, where, and I'll paraphrase this because I haven't got it with me, but the idea uh, that um, the Apostle Paul says, um, there are these three things that remain, faith, hope and love. Um, but the greatest of these still remains, and that is love. Um, now, ironically, um, Alfred's cushion in, in her room is probably... Um, the remains of one of three from the time before, faith, hope and love. Um, but hope and love have been lost because they're not important to the regime anymore. What is important is having faith in it. But faith doesn't always include, without faith without love is, is hollow. Um, now what you've got here is the blue iris is symbolic of faith and hope. Um, but we've lost one of those elements okay so the quotation from the book is on on the wall above the chair a picture framed but with no glass a print of flowers blue irises watercolor uh 
sort of fairly matter-of-factly reported the irony there again of the idea of no glass of course there's not going to be glass because glass is is dangerous people can kill themselves with shattered glass um the blue of the flowers here for the blue iris is perhaps echoic of the wives um, but the faith is gone oh sorry the hope is gone it's just faith that remains uh, we have another blue flower which is the smaller ones at the top there uh, the bathroom is decorated in small blue flowers forget-me-nots with curtains to match now i looked this up for forget-me-nots are symbolic of true love uh, maybe a throwback to the past um, these inc incidences where you've got flowers so this i get the idea that this wallpaper is quite faded um, it's a throwback to past times um, and it's part of this idea of the palimpsest of the novel you know, where an old times has been uh, erased. A palimpsest was an old manuscript where they 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 rubbed out what was on it and then wrote uh, over the the rubbing out a new uh, document because manuscript and parchment was very expensive. So they didn't remake them, they just reused them. Um, but in on these images, on these, um, these manuscripts, the old time, the old... Um, uh, discourse narrative um, would often if you held it up to the light you'd be able to see it you'll see kind of glimmers of it and we get that in Handmaid's Tale with the time before maybe this is another example of a palimpsest where the time before leaks through into the present a uh, bit of an irony here because actually Handmaids are constantly asked to forget uh, the time before and it, um, Aunt Lydia makes it very clear that if they forget it um, it'll be easier on them and in fact she says the next generation of handmaids will find it even easier again because they won't know what the past was like that would have been totally erased uh, finally we've got um, I think these appear in Serena Joy's garden again uh, is the bleeding heart so the image there at the bottom um, again drooping flowers um suggestive again of this kind of misery that we saw with the weeping willow and the uh, weeping catkins that we we had in the description before um but the irony here is uh, and there is a there is a story there's a kind of a greek myth about um the hearts having been captured um and and kept on here but the idea if you look at the the um the flower itself um, the bleeding heart there is it does look like the heart is bleeding so the obvious symbolism there of uh, love that's lost or unrequited love um, which obviously we, we see with um, Luke uh, with Offred's um, uh, attempt to remember and to keep hold of her memories of Luke uh, which seem to be bleeding uh, the final one is is I've not got a uh, written description of that um, but you can see there the lilies and I wanted to just put a picture of the lily on there because um, you can see very clearly the middle bit the like the seeds in the middle there well that's actually the pollen of a lily and if you um, keep them in the house if you if somebody if you're lucky to have them bought for you um, those middle sections those stamens are actually they, they s smell really strongly um, but they also stain so m a lot of people cut them out if you cut them out it reduces the kind of beauty of the flower um, that said these are the reproductive parts of the flower so I think perhaps one of the reasons why the lily was um, represented here and it's represented a couple of times in the novel uh, is because those reproductive parts of the flower are really really clear in this and once it opens up and the bees can get in and they can pollinate other flowers uh, it makes the whole process very sort of um, uh, visual, I suppose. Okay, so um, that is the end of my um, lecture there. Um, there's plenty more symbolism you can look up on um, the internet, but that hopefully gives you a sort of a starting point um, and some interesting notes to take. Thank you.